All right, as we're getting ready to go up on the screen, we'd like you to just review the ground rules with us. Are you there with us now? Ground rules. Number one, give it your all. This event is going to be as good as how much you put into it. So, give it your all. Number two, work as a team. Work as a team. Uh, marriage is a team sport. It's not a singular sport. It's a team sport. So if you're married, you have a husband. If you're a woman, if you're married and you're a man, you have a wife. So work together as a team. Now, whenever we work on marriage, Satan tends to want to come in and divide and bring up problems from the past. We're going to encourage you to be disciplined and to listen to the voice of God and work together as a team. There's something else that we're going to be doing here, and Elaine already mentioned that, and we're going to have a number of exercises that you're going to be working on with your spouse. Now, just in case some of you are a little apprehensive about what we're going to be doing here today, invariably people are afraid to come to marriage conferences because they believe that they're going to have to expose themselves. Nobody will expose themselves today. You're only going to be speaking to your spouse. So the exercises we're doing, you're only doing it with your spouse. You're not sharing with anybody else. You're sharing with your spouse. Many times when we do this, individuals tell us in their evaluations, oh, we need to have more conversation among the couples. No, no, because that, all that creates is gossip. All that creates is you uh, feel salacious because of somebody else's story. This is about your story today. Your story and your, your spouse's story. So the only person you're going to be talking to today is your spouse about your issues, not somebody else's, but yours. So practice. Now, and then number four, pray today and regularly, regularly for your relationship. By now you realize that there are some blanks that you're filling out, and since you're going to need this information after today, we're encouraging you to fill in those blanks so that this guide may serve you in the days to come. So pray regularly, today and regularly, for your relationship, and we're going to pray right now. So let's pray. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful day. Thank you for giving us life anew today. Thank you for your many blessings that you've given to us. Thank you for bringing us here and giving us this opportunity to recommit, to renew our relationship with our spouse. We ask, Lord, that you will bless each and every couple that's here. If there are individuals who are here without their spouse, we ask for blessings for each and every one of them. And we thank you, Father, that you've promised to be with us always. You've also promised to keep us in perfect peace and supply all of our needs. I want to claim these promises on behalf of each couple. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's something I'd like to remind you throughout our day. With God on your side, you cannot fail. Say that with me. With God on your side, you cannot fail. You claim that for your marriage every day, and you're going to be just fine. I certainly claim it. Because with the differences that are operative in our lives every day, we need the power, we need the grace, we need the humility of the Spirit of God to be imbued in us so we can make it and we can be ready for the coming of the Lord. So we're going to go right into our first exercise today. We've already gone through the goals and the ground rules and we're going to go right into our first exercise of the day. All right, so our first exercise is an individual exercise, which means you're going to work on it by yourself, husband, wife, by themselves, and we want you to write down three things that you would like to change or improve about your relationship with your spouse. So we're not talking about your relationship with your mother or your father or your children, something that you would like to improve or change about your relationship with your spouse and then we want you to answer the question, how do you hope this conference will affect your relationship with your spouse? Now you're working on that on your own, 
And um, don't share your answers yet. We're gonna come back to that later on in the day, but it's just to give you some thought about what is it that you're concerned about. There's something else that I wanna share with you as you are working on answering these questions. Don't focus so much on what you wanna change about your spouse. Focus on what you wanna change about yourself, what you wanna do different, what you wanna see happen differently in your relationship. Technicians, we have another bullet that needs to be up on, on the screen. Apparently my remote isn't working from here, so if we can get the other bullet there, that'd be helpful, thank you. So how long are you giving them to work on this? So we'll give you about um, three minutes. Okay, you should have had enough time to work on that exercise. And remember that um, it's really important that you not share the answers yet because we're gonna use that later on. All right, we're gonna go right into our um, Rekindling the Spark segment. And... Next slide, please. And let's say, we're rekindling the spark. So it makes me think about um, when we first met and I was a, um, going into my last year of university at Atlantic Union College in South Lancaster, Massachusetts. And um, my husband here, well, he wasn't my husband at the time. He was pastoring as a single young man. And I like to say that um, he, he came to attend a a minister's conference in South Lancaster on the campus of Atlantic Union College. Now he was a young single pastor in New York City and I think the brethren were getting a little concerned about this because you know every Sabbath you know he would get up and you know everybody was trying to um, marry him off to their um, to their daughters or granddaughters or nieces or cousins or whoever and so I think they were a little nervous, so they sent him up to Atlantic Union College and they put him to stay in the women's residence hall. <laughs> All right, I'm just joking, just, just a little joke. I mean, he actually did stay in the women's res hall, but it was, there were actually guest rooms there. But it, it just always strikes me as odd that he would be the one that got into that um, guest room because there were also guest rooms in the men's dormitory. Anyway, we happened to meet through mutual friends and um, I don't know if you want to, oh, I, well, I usually say that we, we played racquetball. I, I was actually really big on racquetball during those days and he told me that he liked to play racquetball and I told him, I said, well, you know, I have to work in the evening at the gym because I used to work in the ad building during the day and worked at the gym at night so that I can pay for my school bill. And I told him that we could play that evening. And so we played racquetball. He told me that he was a little rusty, that he hadn't played for a while. But um, he was actually not bad. You know, he, he was very, very competitive. He didn't want me to get any points. And it came down to the final point and, um, you know, I looked at him and I thought, you know, this is a nice guy. This is a nice man. And, you know, it probably would behoove me if I let him win. <laughs> so, you know, I had, you know, had a wonderful drop shot that was going to go in the corner that he would not have been able to, to um, you know, return. And I decided, you know what, I'm just gonna let him win. And here we are, the rest is history. We got married. Now, that's a nice story. <laughs> you know, it's almost like an Anansi story, but it's a nice story. It's her story. But if you want history, I'll tell you how it went. It is true, I was a young pastor in New York City, single, and went to a pastoral conference at Atlantic Union College. I think I signed up late because, um, well, I had just started as a pastor not long before and uh, hadn't gotten all the notices. We didn't have email in those days. And so when my senior pastor finally said to me, you need to register for this event, it was a little late and all the guest rooms in the men's dorm were taken. 
So all that was left were guest rooms in the women's dorm. So they put me there. Um, and so I was looking for a friend that was from New York City who had gone to Atlantic Union College and who had graduated and was still in the, in the town. I ran into some women in the cafeteria, which was in the same building with the women's dorm, and they said, we know someone who would know where to find him. That person happened to be Elaine. But when we met, um, as I was coming out of my first meeting, coming through the ad building of Atlantic Union College, and one of the young women who had told me about her said, come, come, let me um, introduce you to the person I was telling you about. So I came up to the business office window, and on the other side was this wonderful woman. And uh, I said, hello. And we chit-chatted a little bit. And then it was time to go to lunch. The assistant dean, the sister of the other young woman, came out of an office and she said, are we going to lunch? And I said, oh, certainly. And I looked at her and I said, you want to do lunch with us? And uh, we've been doing lunch ever since. <laughs> but I'm not going to let her get away with that story about the racquetball. <laughs> we played racquetball. She was actually pretty good for a girl. You know, she, she was actually pretty good. And I said, eh, she's not bad, not bad. I mean, it wasn't all that challenging, but it wasn't that bad. And, you know, but we were playing, and it was pretty heated. And um, I was in my shorts. She saw my legs. The rest is history. <laughs> and then a year later, this is what happened. Show the next slide so they can see what happened. Hair is overrated, people of God. Come on. All right, so all of you have your own stories of when you first met. And so we're going to give you an opportunity right now to talk about your stories. So you'll see in your book there's an exercise, or you can see it on the screen. Um, Let's go write to the down next the slide. first thing that comes to your mind. You don't have to write it down, actually. Just share with each other for about five minutes and reminisce about when you first met. Now, I want to warn you if when you first met, like the first time it was just not a good experience, don't talk about that experience, okay? Talk about the good experiences, all right? Talk about when you first met, your first date, maybe your wedding date. Again, if it, weren't, if it was not a stressful day, you can talk about it. But just spend some time reminiscing about your first thoughts and first memories of each other. We'll give you five minutes. All right, some of you are still speaking, and that's good. You can uh, finish up the exercise when you get home. Uh, apparently, you have done some of it, and, and that's a good thing. Um, a couple of things we're going to say about, about culture as we deal with these events around the world. We try to make it clear that we're not trying to sell American values or American culture around the world. What we're interested in doing is selling Bible culture. What does the Bible say about families? Not, not what they do in the United States or what they do in the West, but what do we say in Scripture? What does the Scripture say about what we're supposed to do? And what we do know is that the Bible says we should talk to each other, you know, talk to each other. Uh, come now, let us reason together. Isn't that what the Bible says in the book of Isaiah? So we're going to be doing that. Uh, Dr. Gardner said something very important at the beginning of our, of, during his uh, exercises, uh, his uh, presentation, and uh, we want to underscore that, that everything that we need for relationships is in the Word of God. Everything is in the Word of God. Now, I'm a family sociologist, and Elaine is a counseling psychologist, and between the two of us, we have six graduate degrees. But you know what? That, that's not that big of a deal. Uh, I'm not really impressed about that. Uh, sociology is just a tool to measure and to analyze, but it's not the truth. And the same with psychology. Psychology is not the truth. It's just a tool. And we will be using that tool to measure and analyze what the Word of God says. But everything that we will say to you today is based on the Word of God. And what we want to do is what God's Word says. So even though sometimes we're in Africa, you know, we don't try to do it the African way. We try to do it the Bible way. When we're in Europe, we remind the Europeans we need to do it the Bible way. When we're in Asia, we try to remind them the Bible way. So before you're Jamaican, you're Christians. So you're Christians, Jamaican Christians, but before a Jamaican Christian, before American Christians. So we want to do it God's way today. We're going to go right into speaking about commitment. Now we noticed that um, some of you were having a really good time 
talking about your first memories of each other. And the reason why we do that exercise is because we want to remind you that every relationship has good things about it. And it's important for us to remember that so that when things are not going so good, we go back to the fact that, you know what? There were some good things about our relationship. There's a reason why God brought us together. So hold on to that exercise and remember that when you're in the heat of battle or when you're thinking that maybe things are not going so well and recall that there's a reason why God brought you together. Now we're gonna talk about commitment because commitment is one of the things that we seem to be struggling with in our relationships today. We noted earlier that marriages all over the world, including here in Jamaica, are really struggling and ending in divorce or separation. And what we see as we work with couples is that there seems to be a lack of commitment. Now when we talk about commitment, there are actually two faces of commitment. There is personal dedication, and personal dedication has to do with the satisfaction in the relationship. How good I feel about this relationship. How, how, um, how dedicated I am to it. How satisfying it is. Now, the problem is, is that too often we get stuck with personal dedication and dedication commitment. Because then we start to think that, well, if I don't feel good about the relationship, if I no longer feel motivated about the relationship, then maybe this relationship it's, has run its course. It's time for it to be terminated. But there's another face of commitment, which is constraint commitment. And constraint commitment kicks in when the dedication is low when I don't feel so good about this relationship. What we know about life is that we can't base our life on our feelings because our feelings will mislead us. And we see that in the word of God, right? The heart above all else is desperately wicked. So it's not a good thing to base our commitment on our feelings, we need some constraints. And constraint has to do with the stability of the relationship. It, what's, it's what keeps us strong, it's what keeps us going. What is a constraint? A constraint is that I made a commitment to you before God, before our family and friends on our wedding day that said we were gonna stay married till death do us part. Now. That death doesn't mean that we're going to kill the other person. Okay, I know let's sometimes just, you feel like it, yeah, but yeah. don't do that. Let, let's be clear about that. I tell people, you know what, I'm, I'm, sometimes I may feel that way, but I don't really look that good in orange or stripes or whatever it is that they have in the prisons. So I think that, you know, maybe, all right, I'm, I'm just kidding. Yeah, we'll work it out. All right, so we need two faces. Do you understand? personal dedication and constraint, and they work together. When dedication is high, things are great. When the dedication goes down as it's going to, we have the constraint. I made a commitment, we have children. And that's a good enough reason for us to stay together. I'm hearing a lot of stuff going around on YouTube or on the news or whatever, where people are having discussions, should we stay together just for the kids? And people are saying, no, because I deserve to be happy. Well, you know what? The only thing you deserve, we see in the word of God, is what? Death. death, right? The wages of sin is death. That's the only thing we deserve, all right? But God gives us life every day. So I don't deserve to be happy. That is a worldly concept. That's a postmodern concept. What I deserve to do is to stay in this relationship and make it work. So if our children are going to keep us together, let them keep us together until we can get our relationship back to that place of dedication. And satisfaction. Now, Jesus had something to say about marriage in the book of Matthew, chapter 19, verses 3 through 6. Read it with us if you can see it from where you're sitting. Let's read it together. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? 
And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. What God has joined together, let man not separate. At what point in our spiritual experience have we just gotten to the place where we believe we can disregard what God has joined? At what point have we gotten there? Elaine and I usually say, and we've done workshops on this topic, we speak about the fact that a crisis in marriage is a spiritual crisis. Hear me now, people of God. A crisis in marriage is a spiritual crisis. What does it take to be a good Christian? What does it take to be the, pe the people of God? To be patient, to be kind. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient. Love is kind. Be humble, right? If we would humble ourselves, Ellen White says, be kind, tenderhearted, pitiful. There'll be a hundred conversions to the truth where today there's only one. And sometimes the people who need to be converted are the people in our homes. The baptized Seventh-day Adventists need to be converted. We need to take God's word seriously. So what God has joined together, let no one separate. Oh, but I'm not feeling it, Pastor. It's not about feeling it. She doesn't make me happy anymore. He doesn't make me happy anymore. We like to say to couples that marriage is not to make you happy. Marriage is to make you married. <laughs> Only Jesus can make you happy. So when you marry someone, and hopefully you've prayed and the Lord has led you, because that's what marriage is all about, it's serious business. So when you've prayed and God has led you to each other, you keep praying. But when you come to Jesus, he's the one who gives you joy. And if you marry someone in Jesus, because be ye not unequally yoked with unbelievers, that person comes with the joy of Jesus. So when I have the joy of Jesus and she has the joy of Jesus, we have joy squared. But what's this nonsense that he doesn't make me happy anymore? Marriage is not to make you happy. In fact, there's an author, a Christian author, not Seventh-day Adventist, but a Christian author in the United States, a psychologist, and what's his name? Gary Thomas, and he has a series of books on sacred marriage. He says, married, marriage is to make you holy. The truth of the matter is, nothing in my experience as a child of God has pushed me to be more holy than the woman God gave me. See, nothing will push me towards that holiness more because I need more holiness to deal with my wife than anybody else. I need more holiness to deal with my wife than to do my work. I need more holiness because it's careful, it's delicate. And sometimes I zig when she zags. And for that you need holiness. What God has joined together, let no one separate. So what do dedicated couples show? Dedicated couples show a marriage identity. When we get married, we become an us. We become a unit. We become a team. Dedicated couples also show a greater emphasis on their marriage and their spouse. You cannot be married and single. When I'm married, my marriage becomes my highest priority. After I have children, my marriage still remains the highest priority. And the two shall become one. You know that one is between the two of us. We're not one with anybody else, not even our children, not our mother, not our parents. We become one, and so we show a greater emphasis on the marriage. We're dedicated to it. We want to see it succeed. You know, there are many of us who are dedicated to a lot of things. We're dedicated to getting degrees, and that's a good thing. Education is wonderful. We're dedicated to gardening, or we're dedicated to buying a new house. Those are all good things. But what we really need to, sh where we need to show dedication, if we're married, is on our relationship, and that needs to be the priority. 
dedicated couples also show greater pleasure from deferring to our spouse's needs. So marriage is not about me. Marriage is about the other person. When we get married, we think about what we can give, not what we can get. And dedicated couples also show a greater importance on protecting the boundaries of their marriage. I often say to people that I am jealous for Elaine, of Elaine for Willie. What does that mean? It means that when I go out in public, I comport myself as a married woman. I let people know I'm married and I have a great husband. Now, even if I'm fighting with him, I'm still protecting myself. Because Satan is busy, people. He's busy and he's just looking for every opportunity to see God's people fail, especially in our relationships, especially in marriage. So when I'm out, I protect myself. If my feelings are hurt, I'm not looking for someone else to soothe my feelings. I'm gonna talk to Jesus and then I'm gonna talk to my husband. So married couples, dedicated couples, put a great importance on protecting the boundaries of their marriage. We present together because marriage is about a man and a woman, and the men need to hear the voice as well. So listen to the voice of a man. When I'm out, I'm protective of myself for my wife. When I'm out, I behave like a married man. Even as a pastor, I behave as a married man. Even in my visits, I behave as a married man. Even as I'm meeting the public and I'm traveling someplace where no one may know me, I behave as a married man. Because what needs to be operative in our hearts and in our minds is exactly what was the value driving Joseph back in Egypt. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against my God? We have to practice the presence of God in our lives every day. So it doesn't matter where we go. Since when is God not going to be there? We are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. And our marriages are exhibit A of that ambassadorship. That's why they will know that we are his disciples because of our love one for the other. There is more. The Christian, the scriptures on dedicated love. And we're going to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 4 and 8. 4 through 8. Read it with us. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, it's not provoke, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. So, if we're in love when we get married, we need to keep loving after we're married. You know, love is like sanctification. And I love the old songs that we used to sing when we're children. I remember as a child in Sabbath school, uh, learning the song every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Sanctification, that needs to be happening in marriage as well. Because when we get married, it's to be sanctified every day closer to Jesus, every day closer to our spouse. I love the other song, I've mentioned it this week with the pastors. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. Every round goes higher, higher. So every day as we are married, our marriage needs to be growing. We need to be growing in Christ and we need to be growing together. And that's the challenge that we want to talk to you about today. That is the challenge because invariably we tend to grow apart. So what happens when we are committed uh, in our relationships? There is commitment for the long haul. And here's what we know. It assists us through the ups and downs. It's just like investing in the stock market. The best investors are the ones who are in for the long haul. You know, those who are serious and who understand how the market works, they know it's not always going to be good. Sometimes it's going down. But if you look at the stock market for the last hundred years, and I'm not here to suggest that you should invest, you know, I'm just telling you how it works, you know, so I, I don't have a Nigerian scheme for you or anything like that. You know, I'm just telling you how it works. If you look at the last hundred years of the market, it's gone up and down and up and down. But a hundred years ago, it was here and today it's there. Marriage is like that. You're investing for the long haul. Sometimes she might burn the beans or the sinka or, or, you know, the dumplings or whatever it is she's doing. Or he may have burnt the soup 
Well, you know, sometimes not so good, but it assists you in the ups and downs, and it makes it worth investing, right? Because we're going to be here not only today, but tomorrow. There's something else that we need to remember, and that it makes it easier for you to not threaten the long-term uh, long-term picture when you're angry. Sometimes we're angry and then we say things to our spouse that we shouldn't say. My brothers and sisters, this is where you live. You know, this is your, this is your well water. Don't throw sewage in your well water. It's your well water. You've got to drink from it. So when you're angry, don't become a knucklehead and start spewing out things you're going to be sorry for later on. It's your water. This is a perfect place, Elaine, to talk about this. Because I know there are lots of people in this audience who probably grew up with an outhouse. And who knew the, the juxtaposition of the well and the outhouse. Are you with me? Are you following me? You know what the outhouse is, right? What do you call it here in Jamaica? Latrine? Okay. I'm, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand, but I know many of you grew up with going on to the latrine, right? Okay. It's okay. We've all used one. Well, that's how marriage is. The well water is our marriage. The latrine is the dirt that we spew on our marriage. Listen, you need to juxtapose the well water from the latrine. Where would you put the well? Where would you put the well? Come on, you know what we're talking about. We're talking about the topography of the ground. Where do you put the well, higher or lower? Higher, higher. why? Because water runs down. So you don't want to put the latrine up there because then that stuff is going to run down into your drinking water and you're going to die. So when you are angry, don't threaten the drinking water. It's your drinking water, you know. You're going to be drinking from it tomorrow. So today, protect your drinking water. Some more. Almost done here. The long-term outlook must be cultivated. So I'm not always happy with Elaine, even I. You know, I'm an ordained minister of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm a graduate of West Indies College, now Northern Caribbean University. I work at the General Conference, and even I, and I do my devotionals every day, but even I sometimes am not so happy with my wife. But you know what? I sued myself because she's my wife, and she's my best friend. And I may not be feeling too good right now, but tomorrow? <laughs> In fact, we're not even waiting on tomorrow. How about tonight? <laughs> yes, I. Yes, I. So we need to protect the future. We're coming down to the end of this presentation. Take it on, Elaine. All right, here's what the scriptures have to say on regaining dedication. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works. And here's the biblical application. You know, this was a text to the church of Ephesus. You know it well. You know your church history well. Church of Ephesus, by the true and faithful witness. But it's also good, a good counsel to marriage. What is that? First thing, remember. What are we rem remembering? Well, some of you met here on this campus and started courting right here on this campus, and now you're married, umpteen years. Remember when you were courting. I remember when I was uh, courting Elaine, young pastor in New York City, she was in her senior year at Atlantic Union College, 200 miles between New York City and Atlantic Union College. It was the shortest 200 miles in my life. <laughs> Sometimes I would be at prayer meeting in the Bronx. I lived in Brooklyn, and I'd be driving my car going home on Wednesday night after prayer meeting. And of course, as you're going, I'm going towards uh, the Whitestone Bridge. But as you're going towards the Whitestone Bridge, it, you see New England Thruway. For those of you who are familiar with the territory, and my car refused to go to Brooklyn. I mean, I'm like, it's Brooklyn time, I gotta go sleep. Nope, no, nope, New England, New England. And two and a half hours later, 200 miles, the fastest 200 miles in my life. Why? Because I was in love. The Bible says, remember, remember. Some of you don't remember. That's why we're trying to remind you to remember. Remember when you were in love with her? Right there. She's not looking right now, but you remember when you started dating her? You couldn't wait to see her. Remember, Scripture says. What else it says? It says, repent. What are we repenting from? From not remembering. <laughs> because when we don't remember, we start doing crazy things. So remember and then repent. And then what else? I like the last message. Do the things you did at first. I know there's 
Elder Brown, I'm sorry. I was coming to you just as your assistant is speaking to you. What is it? Sister Samuels. That's right. That's her name. Sister Samuels. Leave the pastor alone. You remember, Dr. Elder Brown, Pastor Brown, when you were dating your wife, courting your wife. You remember the little things you used to do? Were you on campus together or you didn't meet? No. But you remember? You remember the little things you did for her? Did it make her happy? Did, you, did it make you happy? It says, do the things you did at first. So whatever you used to do back then, do it again. Here's what we say to couples all over the world. Find out what your spouse likes and do it. If it's not immoral and it's not illegal, find out what your spouse likes, Dr. Gardner, and do it. There's another side to that. It's not brain surgery, you know. Find out what your spouse doesn't like and quit doing it. Why are you doing the same thing, expecting a different result? That's the first sign of insanity. Doing the same thing, expecting a different result. It's the same person, you know? So do the things you did at first. Do the things you did at first. Whenever I do the things I used to do when we were dating, Elaine gets happy. And when she gets happy, I get happy. And when I get happy and she gets happy, have mercy, Jesus. All right, so as we conclude this segment, we have an exercise for you, and this is a couple exercise. We want you to talk to each other about the dedication in your own marriage. And remember, we're talking about dedication commitment. Has your dedication to each other been damaged to a dangerously low level? If your answer is yes, what do you want to do about it? If your answer is no, how do you plan to maintain that dedication? Share with your spouse how each of you wants your marriage to be. What do you want in your marriage? How do you want your marriage to be? What do you want your marriage to say to others about who you are? And then close with prayer. Pray, pray together for greater dedication commitment to your relationship and for making it a priority in your busy lives. So we will give you five minutes to do that exercise and we really wanna encourage you to do the exercise and close with prayer. We're happy to hear you speaking to each other. 
And this doesn't have to be the end of this exercise. You can continue talking when you get home. Like they say in Jamaica, right? Stick a pin. <laughs> Stick a pin. You can, you know, continue this conversation later on. But right now we need to close, and we'll close this way. We'll close with a quotation from the Spirit of Prophecy, Adventist Home, page 32. Ellen White tells us in Adventist Home, Let's read it together. One well-ordered, well-disciplined family tells more in behalf of Christianity than all the sermons that can be preached. Satan knows this. That's why he's after your marriage. He knows this because if your marriage is strong, your family is strong. And when your marriage is weak, your family is weak. And when your family is weak, you have no witness. And when you have no witness, What we need you to do as Seventh-day Adventists, you're not doing. Because this is not only for the leadership of the church. This is for the membership of the church. We need you to be strong. We need your marriages to be strong so the church can be strong. This is the legacy you're leaving to your children. What you do in your homes will determine what will happen in their homes. You want your children to have happy marriages? You need to have happy marriages because you're modeling to them, you know. And you don't need to model perfection, but you need to model forgiveness. You need to model grace. You need to model the fact that even when we disagree, we can come back and agree and pray together and work together and build up the kingdom of God. This is hard stuff. That's why we like to end always with the promise of success. In Philippians 4.13, what does it say? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You believe that? Who believes the word of God? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're just humbled by um, the fact that you've brought us together. Lord, we just want to surrender our hearts. We want to surrender our marriages to you, asking you to fill it with grace, with peace, with dedication, so that we can reflect your glory here on earth. And thank you, Father, that we can trust in you. And you're always available. And your strength is omnipotent. We ask for that strength for each couple, regardless of what Satan is throwing at them right now. We know that he is mighty, but you are almighty. We rebuke Satan and ask him to leave our families, to leave our marriages, so we can give honor and glory to God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're gonna give you a 10 minute break, 10 minute break, and we're saying 10 because by 15 minutes you'll be back in your seats for the next segment. And uh, so let's take just a break, catch your breath if you need to go to the bathroom and come right back because we need to hit it hard. Now, we took a little longer on the first segment because we had some technical things that we had to get together. Now we have them together, we're gonna run for the rest of the day. Blessings. If home is really where 
Another hearty amen to the grants for that beautiful song. Now we're looking at the program now and realize that your program is a little different than we're used to. And so here's what we're going to do. We're not going to have any breaks because I think the way Dr. Bowers worked out this program is for you to take your own break when you need it, run to the bathroom and come back quickly so that we can go and stick to the program that he has outlined. So we're going to stick to the program that he has outlined so that we can stay together and uh, move together. Please direct your attention to the screen. This event is being serviced by a medical team comprising of one doctor, two registered nurses, two first aid responders and one emergency medical technician working out of one ambulance and one sick bay. In the event of a medical emergency we ask that you attract the attention of an usher, a loss prevention and risk management officer or a member of the medical team. This building has nine exits, three to the front, one on each balcony, one to the left and one to the right of the building and two to the back of the building on either sides of the podium. All exits are identified with illuminated exit signs and emergency lights that will be automatically activated in the event of a power failure. If it becomes necessary to evacuate the building, it is very important that you remain calm. Walk briskly to the closest exit. Please do not run or push the person in front of you. Upon exiting the building go directly to the assembly point, at the steps to Christ. It is very important that you follow all instructions that may be given over the public address system or bullhorn. Loss preventions and risk management ushers and our emergency response team will assist you in getting safely to the assembly point. We ask that you do not re-enter the building for any reason until the all clear is given by the Director of Loss Prevention and Risk Management. The Occupational Safety and Health Office along with the Northern Caribbean University family, welcomes you to our home and wishes for you an enjoyable and safe event.
please be mindful of what you just watched in the case of an emergency. Now, I don't know what has happened to my remote control clicker. You don't see it, don't know if someone took it. If you did inadvertently, if you can bring it back to us. That's the only way I communicate with my slides up on, up there. So if someone saw it, it's just a little clicker. You can bring it back to us, can't find it. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Samuels. An evangelist, you always need an evangelist. West Jamaica is in the house. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going right on to the next segment, Becoming Intimate Allies. Whether you know it or not, we need presidents in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. They have special gifts. You see, he knew that it couldn't be far. So he came and he found it. We need presidents. Thank you, Brother President. Becoming intimate allies. As we think in terms of becoming intimate allies, we have to think about our own lives and what we do in this mad race that we have around the world trying to prepare God's people for his soon coming. So this visual here is just, um, just about 14 months ago, we were doing training in the Trans-European Division of Family Ministries Leaders across Europe and uh, in Athens, in Athens, Greece. And our hotel was about a mile and a half from the Acropolis. So we ran there every morning. That was our connection. As we prayed up there and we connected with each other, you have to find ways how to connect and how to remain intimate allies. So that's just a visual to make that operative. We also wanted to just flash up the fact that we have a new book coming out at the end of this, uh, this month, uh, Real Family Talk. And uh, it should be in the Adventist Book Centers by the end of the month or early in March in Jamaica. Look out for it. A lot of what we're talking today about, you can reinforce as you read that book. That's just for your benefit. We're going right into the paradox of marriage. Here's a quote that we found some years ago, which would probably very accu accurately represent um, marriage for you. Getting married is easy. Staying married is more difficult. Staying happily married for a lifetime would be considered among the fine arts. So we're not asking for any witnesses today, but we all know that um, staying happily married is quite a challenge, and yet it's not impossible. Here's what, God has, here's what the Word of God has to say in Genesis 2, 18, 20 and 25. The Lord God said, and we read it earlier, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. But for Adam, no suitable help was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. This is the greatest love story ever told. And this is what God intends for our marriages. When we talk about becoming intimate allies, we're talking about husbands and wives becoming close, 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 close friends. And we'll talk a little bit more about what the true meaning of intimacy is. What we're sharing with you today, as we keep saying, is the biblical model of marriage. The notion of oneness as opposed to the secular notion of individualistic thinking that bombards us uh, from every avenue in the world we live in today. We want to be clear that marriage is more than just a piece of paper. It's more than just a set of vows. It's more than beautiful dresses and gowns and nicely decorated churches. That's the easy part. 
Marriage is intended to reflect God's glory, to reflect the way he loves his people. And so in this segment, we're talking about that kind of marriage that God intends for us. As we go into this section, we first want to, we secondly want to look a little bit at some social scientific research. And we're looking at a particular study that has been done, which is about factors associated with future divorce and or marital distress. And what we love about a lot of the research that's coming out today is the fact that the stuff that's coming out is basically just reaffirming, not that the scripture needs to be reaffirmed, but it really reaffirms what we already know from scripture. So there are some factors that are associated with distress in marriage, and there are two types of factors. There are static factors and there are dynamic factors. I'm gonna look, talk right now about the static factors, and I want you to pay close attention because the static factors are factors that cannot be changed or can't easily be changed. There are factors that will impact your marriage, but there are things that cannot be changed. And some of those things are personality factors. Each of us brings our personality to the marriage, our temperaments. That is going to be a factor in your relationship, as you can all attest to, right? Your, your parental divorce. If your parents were divorced, it's going to impact your marriage. If you lived together, cohabitation history, that's going to impact your marriage. And there are all kinds of studies about that, but we also know what the scripture says. So we didn't have to do any type of research to figure that out. Previous divorce, if you were previously divorced, it's going to impact your marriage. Religious dissimilarity is also a static factor. If you are an unequally yoked, it's going to serve as a distress factor in your marriage. Young age at marriage, if you get married too early before you are mature enough, that's gonna mitigate against your marriage and also economic status. I know a lot of people say, you know, um, poor people have better marriages, that's not true. Because if you don't know where the money is gonna come from to pay for food or rent or housing or shelter or clothing, um, that's going to be distressful in your marriage. Doesn't mean that people who have money are happier, it just means that economic status is gonna mitigate against your relationship. Just before Elaine goes on to the dynamic factors, I wanted to say something about uh, young age at marriage so we can give you a benchmark and simply to say that what we know from the research is that people who marry before age 25 have higher divorce rates than people who marry after age 25. So just keep it in mind. So you get married before 25 and then all, all of a sudden you're 25 and judgment hits and you, you want to know, oh, why am I with this guy? But remember, with God, all things are possible. That's a static factor. If you got married before 25, it's a static factor. You can't change it. You can just trust in Jesus now. All right, that would be me since I got married before age 25. So I just call on the name of Jesus every day. Good, anyway. Good, good for you, sister. This is a good thing. All right, so what did I say about the static factors? There are things that cannot be changed or they can't easily be changed. You can't change the fact that you married someone um, that is not of the same faith. Now, those of you who are here, you're already married, right? Those of you who are not married yet, go back to the word of God of not being unequally yoked. But those are static factors. We're gonna talk now about the dynamic factors. And hear me now, the dynamic factors are things that can be changed. They're things that can be changed. And the dynamic factors are the primary reasons why people are experiencing distress or divorcing. Did you hear what I said? So we looked at the static factors and we said they're things that cannot be changed or can't easily be changed but they're actually not the primary reasons why couples are experiencing distress. We need to be mindful of them, and we need to keep them in our minds, but the primary reason for distress in marriage or divorce are the dynamic factors. What are these dynamic factors? Interactive processes, which are, 
can be danger signs. What is an interactive process? The way I relate to my spouse every day. I wake up in the morning, when you wake up in the morning and your spouse says, good morning, dear, do you say, what's good about it? <laughs> Just go take out the garbage. Well, I'm sure when you got married, when you were started courting each other or dating each other, you were all sweet, oh sweetheart, oh honey boo boo, oh darling, would you please do this? Or can I do this for you? Yes, you can. Right? So we stop relating to each other in a kind way. Now, which one of you got married because you thought, you know what, I want to get married because I just want to have a good fight? That's not why we got married, right? We got married because we wanted to be close to someone. We wanted to have someone that we could be intimate with, that we can talk with, that we can dialogue with, that will really become our best friends. So what happens somewhere along the line where all of a sudden we're like, look, I don't care what you have to say, just do what you have to do. When did, how did we get to be like that? that Interactive process is number one reason why couples are experiencing distress. We don't know how to speak to each other anymore. And, and the Bible gives us lots of counsel on how we should talk to one another. So interactive process. Number two, communication ability. It's pretty much the same thing, how we communicate. Now, remember those static factors? The economic status, um, the young age at marriage, what else? Religious dissimilarity. Religious dissimilarity. How do we communicate about that? See, my mother told me I shouldn't have married you. She told me I was too young. I should have listened to her. Right? All of a sudden, we don't know how to communicate with each other. And so those static factors, yes, there are issues, but it's how we communicate about those status, static factors. It's how we resolve conflict our conflict management about the fact that we're struggling with money? <clears throat> Are we destroying our relationship? Are we throwing sewage into the relationship because we're struggling financially? Are we working together as a team? Another dynamic factor is physical aggression. And of course, that is not something that can be easily changed. And what we should say at this point is that everything that we're doing here today is for relatively healthy relationships. What does that mean? Relationships that are good, relationships that are even struggling a little bit, but there are some relationships where there might be abuse or infidelity and there are all kinds of other issues which are not the majority of relationships. So when we speak, the things that we're talking about, it's in the absence of abuse and infidelity and other destructive patterns that are, in that are in relationships, okay? So we don't want anyone to leave here today and say, well, the Olivers said, you know, if we could just communicate a little better, then maybe the violence will go away, okay? When it comes to physical aggression, that is something that needs some type of third-party intervention, a good counselor, a good Christian counselor, who can help you walk through and work through some of those issues. Dysfunctional attitudes is another dynamic factor. How I feel about my relationship. Do I wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I have a great relationship with some sad times? Or do I wake up and say, oh my, oh, you know, I committed at the altar that I was gonna stay married for life for 50 years. Oh, 10 down, 40 more to go. So our attitude has a lot to do with how we see our relationship and how successful our relationship is gonna be. And the last dynamic factor is commitment and motivation. And we spoke about that earlier. How committed am I to making this relationship work? I often say to people, I refuse to be in an unhappy marriage. I also refuse to be divorced. So there's a third alternative. That is to have a great marriage. Work it out. I can work it out. I can wake up every morning and say, okay, yesterday wasn't so great, today's gonna be a great day. You know, this morning wasn't so great, this afternoon is gonna be a great day. I can make a difference through the power of God 
to have a great marriage. And you know what? It's great if both of us are thinking that way, but we also know that if one makes a decision that they're going to just be committed and motivated, it, it becomes infectious. It becomes infectious, and I can change the dynamic in my relationship. In fact, there's something that we learned um, in, in our training along the way, and that is, you know, it used to be people would say it takes two to tango, but it really takes one. You know, one person can change the reality of marriage. I'll give you an example. Now, we have a lot of brilliant people here, and you know what the chemical property of water is? What is it? H2O. It means what? Two particles of hydrogen and one of oxygen, correct? Okay, so what happens if we remove one particle of hydrogen? What do we have? What do we have? Anybody? I hear rumblings. Raise your hand and tell me. Somebody said oxygen and some other stuff? Okay, I haven't heard the, the, the answer I'm looking for. You know, it's, it's, it's simpler than what you think. Don't think too hard. Not water. See? H2O is water. H-O is not water. Okay? What's the difference? One particle was changed, and you no longer have water. So, look at the equation of your marriage. Okay? Every day you come home, and there's a negative spiral, and there's a negative sequence in the way you converse with each other. All it takes is for one of you to change that response to change the reality of your marriage. John Gottman, one of the leading marriage researchers in the United States, uh, says that the first three minutes of conversation when a couple gets home after work will determine how the rest of the evening will go. So you can decide to have good conversation with your spouse, to, lift, to leave your sour puss attitude at work or, or, or in the, on the bus or on the car or at the door and bring your sweet self into your home because the angels, Ellen White says, love to dwell when our homes have that sweet savor of Jesus Christ. So it takes one. So don't tell me, Pastor, you don't know my husband. You don't know my wife. No, I don't know your husband or your wife. What I do know is that with Jesus, you can make it. He gives you joy. Accept the joy and bring that joy into your home. It takes one. If you bring joy into your home and your spouse is committed to bringing joy into your home, you're going to have joy square. If you don't make any decisions, if you don't make any determinations, you're going to get the same old sour puss house that you have, maybe. Are you with me? So, it takes one. So here's what we know about the reality of marriage. The reality of marriage is that husbands and wives will naturally grow apart. People get married, they're all excited, and then a few years go by, sometimes a few months, sometimes a few weeks, and all of a sudden... They're not feeling it anymore. Well, I got news for you. That's, that's not strange. In fact, if you're excited when you get married and you do nothing, you're going to grow apart. Are you with me? You know why? Because we're all sinners. Born in sin, shaped in iniquity, we're sinners. And you know what sin is? Separation. Bible says the wages of sin is death. But really, when you go back to Eden and you look at what happened when sin came in, what happened after Adam and Eve ate the fruit? What happened when Jesus came looking for them? What happened? What happened? They went hiding. Why were they hiding? They felt the separation from God. Why? They were disobedient. So we're all disobedient. We're human beings. And you know what happens? If we do nothing for our marriages, we're going to grow apart. So as Christians, people of God, if our marriages are going to be good, we're going to have to decide we want them to be good. When we decide we want them to be good, we bring ourselves and we do something good for our marriage. Every morning I wake up and I want to be a great husband to Elaine. You know, regardless of what her mood is, it's, this is all about me. This is all about my mood and what I bring to my marriage. I can't be worried about what Elaine is going to bring to our marriage today. I can only be worried about what Willie's going to bring to his marriage today. Are you with me? I need to choose joy. I need to choose forgiveness. I need to choose grace. I need to choose a good attitude. So it doesn't matter what she does, I need to determine in my heart that I'm going to do right for our marriage. Why? Because we promise in sickness and in health. Because we promise God that we will do it so. So these are things that we need to be mindful of. Look at this graphic. It is Elaine and me. This is 2007. 
and we're at the marker. We're out in the middle of the Serengeti. We're speaking for the East Central Africa Division. This time we were in the North American Division, and somebody took us on safari in the Serengeti. Now that marker is right way out in the Serengeti, and it's the border between Kenya and Tanzania. Now, Elaine is in Kenya, I'm in Tanzania. And some of your marriages are just like that. You're in the same picture, same marriage. You look really nice. See how we're smiling? See how we're smiling? Look really nice. But one is in Kenya and one is in Tanzania. And you know what? Never shall the twain meet. See? We come to church on Sabbath. And by the way, every Sabbath, Satan comes to visit the Avenue's home. He came this morning. You don't have to confess. I know he came. And I often say to pastors, you know, there's one of the spouses who must be on time. The other one simply cannot. And there comes Satan. And you're in the car and you're coming all the way to church, quarreling and fighting and again for the umpteen time. And we've been married now 30 years and you haven't changed. And this got to stop because this is ridiculous and you're a Christian and you're an adult and what else, all of this. Don't, and then forget, we, don't forget some good scripture text. No, no text. At this quotes. time, you're not even thinking about the Bible. And then you get to church. Happy Sabbath. You know what we're talking about. You understand? Yes? All right, so here's a probability in marriage. Husbands and wives can become intimate allies. We can become intimate allies. That's what we signed up for when we, became, when we got married. We can either learn to live with what's wrong, which is happening in a lot of our marriages, which is only going to lead to resentment, contempt, and isolation. And that's where the marriage breaks down, and that's where people feel that they grew apart and they're no longer meant to be together. Some people even actually will write to us and tell us, you know what? From the beginning, I knew this was not of God, so is it okay if I leave my spouse? I know there's a little hush, right? No, we literally, there's not a week that goes by that we don't get a letter to our office in our prayer box asking for prayer for... The, for Forgot to give them a for, new spouse. The good one, the right one this time. I'm telling you right now, that's not a prayer we can pray. Okay, that's not a prayer we can pray. So we can either learn to live with what's wrong or we can learn to pray for our marriages. We can learn to fight for our marriages, and that's what we're going to need to do. I am fighting for my marriage. I'm fighting too. 30 years we've been together. Ladies, I'm telling you, I've worked hard. <laughs> See how nice he looks? I've worked hard. I'm not giving him to anybody. Not a soul. He's mine. After I've trained him, I'm going to now give him up to somebody else to benefit? Now, I'm just going to work with what I have. Can I get a witness? So listen, we're engaged in serious warfare. You know, we stop preaching those messages. Pastors keep preaching the message of the second coming. Jesus is coming soon. And we need to be ready, people of God. We need to be ready. You know, when I was a little girl, the pastors used to preach about persecution. And they used to talk about, remember those days? They used to talk about how you're going to show up at the church on Sabbath mornings, and the doors were going to be locked, and we were going to have to run to the hills. Let me just tell you something. We're in persecution right now. If you don't believe that, Sabbath mornings, we're being persecuted. We don't have to wait for those church doors to be locked. We're, 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 missing, we're missing it, and Satan is having a field day. But here's the answer. Husband and wives, we need to get on the same team. We need to get ourselves together. And instead of blaming each other, instead of pointing at each other, we need to look at the problem out here. And we need to say, oh, it's the enemy. It's the enemy. And we're a team. We're going to work together. 
We're going to be intimate friends and warriors against the enemy. Praise the Lord. So what is intimacy? What is this intimacy we keep talking about? Here's a dictionary definition of intimacy, the quality of being comfortable, warm, or familiar. Sometimes people get uncomfortable um, when we use the word intimacy. In fact, we've gone to some places in the world where we're, we are asked not to use the word intimacy. We have to change the title of our, of our workshop if we ever use that word because it has connotations of sexuality. But look at this definition. It says genuine intimacy in human relations requires dialogue, transparency, vulnerability, and reciprocity. There, there's no sex talk in there, right? I mean, it could be, but that's not what it's talking about. So intimacy has to do with the warmth, with the closeness in our relationship. I like the Bible definition of intimacy, and we find that in the book of Genesis, of uh, Genesis, Okay, see if we can get this on. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 5, read it with me. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. I like to call it na na, naked and not ashamed. And sometimes when we read the scripture, we think it's talking about sexuality. Well, it's a lot more than sex. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. That's what intimacy is about, to be naked and not ashamed. Watch this. How open are you when you talk to your spouse? Do you share everything? Can you share your feelings? If you're a pastor, you felt beaten up after your Bible studies and your visits today, can you talk to your spouse about that? You're not feeling too well today. You're feeling spiritually weak today. Can you ask your spouse to pray for you? When we look at this text, we think it's physical, but it's a lot more than just physical. It's speaking about emotional intimacy. It's also speaking about spiritual intimacy. It's also speaking about financial intimacy. I mean, how are your finances at home? Your spouse knows where your money is? Well, you got stuff hidden here and there, and I don't want him to know, pasta, because I want to got my little nest egg back here, you know? Hold on to my money. Is it your money and his money, or do you have your money? Our money. Listen, our money, everything that you do that brings you together will make you closer. Anything that you do that's separate will split you apart. So, I like this. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Actually, God has a blueprint about this. What is that? It's up in Matthew 19.6. Let's read it together. So then, there are no longer two, but one flesh. God wants us to be one flesh in marriage, together on the same page, in the same country, not only in the same picture, in the same country, in the same home, in the same marriage. Good to see the Camerons. That's the kind of marriage God wants us to have. Of course, this mystery of this oneness is somewhat of a mystery to us. And so let's take a look at what this oneness should look like. When we get married, we come together and there's me plus you and we form a new couple identity that's us. And we spoke about that earlier, that now we have a new identity. Now, to be sure, that does not mean that I lose my person and he loses his person. What it means is that we have to learn to accommodate each other in this new us. But our identity is an us. And remember, we spoke earlier about protecting those boundaries because we're no longer single. I can no longer just do me. It's not about me anymore, it's about us. That's the struggle that we're having in today's world because our society is all about me. It's all about what's in it for me. And if it's not good for me, then I'm out of here. But in biblical marriage, the two become one. Now, there is a differentiated oneness, which means I learn to respect who you are, and you learn to respect who I am. But if there's a little bit of me that needs to go in order for be, us to be an us, then maybe that needs to be revisited. Now, of course, someone once said, you know, Lord, um, you know, I, I want the two of us to be one, but which one? 
This is true. And many times in many of our cultures, uh, we're so male dominated. And not only um, in Jamaica, you know, in the United States as well. Men dominate. And we don't understand. We don't understand the difference between headship and being a boss. The head is not the boss. See, we, we come at it with our own anthropomorphic eyes, our humanity, our human eyes, and we think that to be the head is to be the boss. But that's not what it means. That's not what it means. In fact, well, let's just take a look at what Ellen White says in, in the spirit of prophecy. You know, she was way ahead of her time. Read this with us. God requires that the wife shall keep the fair and glory of God ever before her. Entire submission is to be made only to the Lord Jesus Christ who has purchased her as his own child by the infinite price of his life. Read it with me. God has given her a conscience which she cannot violate with impunity. Her individuality cannot be merged into that of her husband, for she is the purchase of Christ. It is a mistake to imagine that with blind devotion, she is to do exactly as her husband says in all things, when she knows that in so doing, injury would be work for her body and her spirit, which have been ransomed by the slavery of Satan. There is one who stands higher than the husband to the wife. It is her redeemer, and her submission to her husband is to be rendered as God has directed, as it is fit in the Lord. hundred years ago, <laughs> somebody's saying, ah, that's feminism. That's Ellen White. That's spirit of prophecy. That's God directing this woman to write for the people of God, for our own liberation. Marriage is not to be the context of subjugation. Marriage is to be the merging of two lives, and the two shall become one flesh. Nobody takes a hammer and bangs their own finger. That's what Ephesians is talking about. It says everyone cherishes their own body, and so should be husband and wife. So it's not about me being boss. I'm the head. But I'm the head like Jesus is the head of the church. And Jesus as head as the ch of the church is a suffering servant. He's a servant leader. Are you with me, people of God? You're mighty quiet out there. We need to bring this kind of stuff, this value into our marriages so that no one feels subjugated. Submission is not about subjugation. Submission is about living in peace. In fact, verse 21, which we often don't quote, of Ephesians 5 says, be subject to each other out of reverence for Christ. So the major submission is to Christ. And if we're both submitted to Christ, then wives can submit to husbands, and husbands can love their wives as Christ loved the church. I love like this will never pass away. God has put together, can't let no man put asunder. Our love like this will stand the storm, come wind, rain, and come thunder. Our love like this, it will never, no, never pass away. What you mean? It seems the Lord has blessed us with a love that makes Cupid wanna hang up his bow. Oh, oh, oh. Mm. For 
got better Oh, for worse In sickness Or in health I want to love you when you're poor Or if you've got a little bit of wealth I love like this, yes It will never, no, never pass away Since you're married, I'm going to ask the couples just to give your spouse a nice little squeeze. And if you want to, you can hug your spouse. We do hug our spouses, especially on the Sabbath. Very good. Sing a love like this still does exist, and we thank the Lord for blessing us with it. A love like this still does exist, and we thank the Lord for blessing us with it. A love like this still does exist, and we thank the Lord for blessing us with it. Sister Kirkland. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for being with us. And thank you for continuing to be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our last segment before lunchtime, Solving Your Solvable Problems. So one Sabbath morning, we were on our way to do a family ministries um, Sabbath, very similar to this one. Of course, not as large. This is grand, you know. They, they say it's better in the Bahamas, but I think it's bigger in Jamaica. Better, too. <laughs> I would agree. Um, that, I hope that's not on tape. You can scratch that from the tape. Because anyway. we, we have to go there next. <laughs> anyway, we're on our way to do a family ministry Sabbath, and um, it was a beautiful Sabbath morning, and we were actually driving to that event because it was not too far from, from our home, and we were having a wonderful time. You know, it was one of those mornings where we were really in sync with each other, and, you know, the skies were blue, and the birds were chirping, and the trees were green, and everything was just wonderful, and... 
Because we were driving, we had our trusty navigational system in the car with us, and it was telling us where to go. And it was a short trip, probably about a two-hour trip. And our, our GPS, as we call it, is, um, actually has a woman's voice on it, and her name is Mandy. And Mandy was leading us along the way and telling us where to go. As we approached the church, we got on the street where we were supposed to go. Um, my husband said to me, um, uh, take, put away, put away. Since her husband said it, <laughs> let me say it so, so you know what I said. <laughs> so, um, so we're turning on the street where the church is, but we have no idea if it's a mile down or three miles. And, you know, we could see that it was a little rough neighborhood. You know, having spent quite a number of years in, in Brooklyn, New York, and understanding what neighborhoods are like, and we have one of those navigations that are at that time on our windshield. I said to Elaine, please take down the GPS. I don't want to get to the church. And then people see that we took it down and then break into our car to steal the GPS. So I said, please take down the GPS. So I was right on track with him. You know, we were, we were getting along well. And, you know, I read him. I knew exactly what he was saying because, you know, we'd lived in in places where, you know, you understand neighborhoods. And so I did exactly as he told me. I put away the GPS. So, you know, we're driving and all of a sudden I don't hear Mandy and I'm not sure how close we are to the church. So when I looked around, I noticed that the GPS was nowhere to be seen. And, and I said, uh, Pastor Archer, I said, uh, what happened to the GPS? So I said, I did exactly what you told me to do. I put away the GPS. Said, now I'm thinking, we're on the street. Remember the days when we didn't no, have No explanation GPSs? needed. No explanations. Let's, re, re, let's re, stay with the story. Re, let's stay re, with the story. Remember those days? I just want to tell them what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, you know, we're tracking together and we're, we're on we're the street. We're missing the punchline here, sweetheart. What, what happened before we had GPSs? We knew how to we're, work without we're them. We're missing anyway, the punchline. Anyway, so he So told I said, me, what happened to the GPS? And so she I said... said I did what you told me. I put away the GPS. I said, no, no, no. I asked you to take it no, down. No, you told me to put it away. I asked no, you no, to no, take no. it you down. You told me to put it away. And, and we're, here and we're we going are. to church to tell people how to have a great marriage. <laughs> so tell them what happened. So I said, you know, Satan is in this car. Why, why are you laughing? <laughs> Remember what I said earlier. He's not Satan. <laughs> we are on the same team. And we're fighting the enemy together, right? So we have an understanding in our home. Now, don't try this at home if you don't have this understanding. We understand that when we recognize that Satan is trying to get at us, that we need to... Get, we need to protect ourselves, right? We need to fight him together. And so we both understood what that meant, and we just kind of calmed down. And, you know, we had some good music on. We had something probably like CeCe Winans singing, um, you know, um, I want to talk wanna, like you. I want to be just like you, Jesus. I want to walk like you. I want to talk like you. I, I want to love, love like, like you. you. Just you know, like you, Jesus. This is why it's a good thing to have like nice Christian spiritual music playing in your car. Right? Because sometimes we have some stuff like, you know, kick that bad boy to the curb or something like that. You know, and if something like this happens, you're going to want to kick him to the curb. So we just listened to the music. We allowed ourselves to pray, and we were able to calm down. And we were able to arrive at church in a good place where we were able to preach and to teach in the way that God wanted us to. Right? So this was a problem right? But it wasn't a real problem. And John Gottman, that marriage researcher that we spoke about earlier, says that only about 30% of our problems are solvable. Okay, I know, I know that you're saying with God on our side, we cannot fail. This is true. But 70% of the times we're arguing about nothing, 
What was the argument in the car about? Nothing. Nothing. I'm right. You're right. I'm right. You're right. We don't even know what we're arguing about. We're just saying, well, you told me to put it away. No, you told me to put it away. Wait, we're just trying to get to church. So 70% of our problems are not solvable. And so what we're talking about in this segment is solving your solvable problems. Let's learn how to identify what our real issues are and how do we communicate in a way that we can have the type of peace in our homes that God wants us to have. Here's what the Bible says in the book of Romans, chapter 12 and verse 18. We have it on the screen. Read it with us. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. As far as it depends on you. You can't worry about the other one. You've got to worry about yourself. What am I doing to make a difference in this marriage? What am I doing to allow the Spirit of God to use me to influence my marriage? What am I doing to make this marriage a better place to be? What am I doing to make it stronger and healthier? What am I doing? As far as it depends on me, live at peace with everyone. All right, so right now we want to look at some patterns that destroy oneness. Earlier we spoke about barriers to oneness. Now we want to look at certain patterns that we have in our relationships. What we um, see here is that there are patterns that marriage researchers, marriage therapists have identified as they've worked with couples that seem to be recurring in all couples. We know that there are many, many, many ways in which people can have a great marriage. You know, there's no one, two, or even three ways in which people have a great marriage. Yes, you're committed. Yes, you're, you love each other. But people who have great marriages, they figure out what it is they need to do. What we also know is that when we're having distress in our marriage, there are some patterns that are, that are kind of across the board in most marriages. And we're going to look at those four um, patterns right now. The first one that we want to look at is called escalation. Escalation. And escalation is when someone says something, like in the car, and um, it is interpreted, um, it is received in a bad way, and then the next person, the other person feels that they have to up the ante and say something else. Like, what did you do with the GPS? Well, you told me to put away. Well, no, you put... And before long, you're all the way up here for no good reason. Right? That's escalation. And here's the danger of escalation, is that when we get hyped up like that, our adrenaline starts flowing, our heart starts racing, and then we start saying things that are destructive to the relationship, and we can't take it, take it back. Escalation is when we have difficulty exiting a heating, heated discussion. So what do good couples do? What do healthy couples do? They learn how to exit. And anyone can exit. Just give up the right to be right. Give up the right to win. Because in marriage, what we want is we want the us to win. It's not just about me winning. It's about us winning. We're a team. So as with the car, we were able to exit it. Now, I told you, we're just, we're just normal people. But we're normal people that are committed to living according to God's word and to using the skills that we teach people. And the skills work. Remember we said about those dynamic factors. they are things that can be changed. And the way we communicate with each other, we can change. So when we're healthy, we learn how to get out of these negative cycles, how to exit a heated argument, so that we can calm ourselves down, so that we can have a more constructive time. I want to just follow up a little bit about what happened in the car. Now again, that was a kind of conversation where it really didn't need any serious discussion afterwards because it was ridiculous, right? Some arguments you do have to speak more after you de-escalate, but right now the key is learning how to de-escalate. Well, I simply wanted to say that while we're talking about skills, these are all skills while we're using psychological language. They're all biblical principles. They're all based on biblical principles in the Word of God. And I want to underscore that as we go on to the second pattern that destroy oneness. 
All right, another pattern that we're looking at is called negative interpretations. And negative interpretation is when something that is said is interpreted more negatively than it was intended. So for instance, you might have gotten up this morning and um, you put on your, your yellow shirt. And your wife says, well, you know, let me do it the other way around, because it's usually the other way around. You really? Put on, you put on your yellow dress. Really? <laughs> All right, let's go with it. Elaine says it, it happens the other way. All right, you put so on she comes yellow... out of her closet, and I say what? to her, you gonna wear that to church today? What's wrong with what I'm wearing? What do you mean am I gonna wear this? Of course I'm gonna wear this. Don't you see this on me? No, no. I just don't understand why you have to always be so negative about what I'm wearing. No, no, sweetheart. That, that, that's not it. I, I'm, not, I'm not against what you're wearing. It's that I thought last night we agreed that, we will, that you would wear the blue dress so I can match you with my blue tie, but all of a sudden I see that you you're know, wearing I'm, something I'm different. I'm just tired of you always telling me what to do. I'm just, it, it just really just bothers me. Okay, do you see the negative interpretation? Now you're like in a whole negative cycle. You can't even hear what the person is saying. And in a few minutes, you're saying happy Sabbath to somebody. <laughs> That's a negative interpretation. And how we can avoid that is to give your spouse the benefit of the doubt. Give your spouse the benefit of the doubt. You know, sometimes it may even have been intended negatively. But let it go. It's just not that deep. It's not that important. So give your spouse the benefit of the doubt and just assume they meant something good or what can we do? Don't even assume. Just ask, you know, what, what did you mean by that? Yeah, what I meant was, well, I wanted to match you today and I thought we'd agree to that, you know, because I want to look like we're together. Oh, no problem. We can do this. Now, we don't want to sugarcoat this and we recognize that some relationships have been so battered by negativity that it's hard to rise above it. But we can start to talk about these issues and we're gonna talk a little bit later about how to solve our solvable problems. And that can be a real issue. But again, if we practice giving our spouse the benefit of the doubt, it will help to um, negate some of the negativity or helping us to not see it as negative. Another pattern that destroys oneness is invalidation. And invalidation is when we either on purpose or not on purpose put our spouse down. And one that is a little more subtle is your spouse comes home and says, you know, man, you know, I just had such a, a tough day. Today was a really hard day. And you say, oh, don't worry about it. It's okay. It'll be better tomorrow. That's a little more subtle, right? Because you really intended to help. But when someone comes home and says, you know, I was just so tired. I was so exhausted. What are they looking for? Some sympathy, some empathy, some understanding, maybe some a listening ear. You know, because you started talking, there's something you want to talk about, that person wants to talk about. So we invalidate our spouse when we say, oh, you know, it's going to be bad. I had a rough day too. You know, my day was really bad. So that's a form of invalidation, not on purpose. But one that is on purpose is when your spouse says, um, does something, let's say, they, they cleaned up the kitchen and you said, you clean the kitchen? What happened to the garbage? I, I just, uh, that's foolishness. I, I mean, you've been cleaning kitchens for, for all your life and you don't take out the garbage when you clean no, the kitchen? No, 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 the men don't clean kitchens in Jamaica. I know, some of there, you there do. There are men who do clean the kitchens in Jamaica, right? Yes. <laughs> Go to the but, next one. But you understand? You understand what I'm saying? Someone does something and you find the fault. It's a put down. How many people want to do it again tomorrow? You're not interested, right? So we have ways in our relationships of invalidating one another and successful couples learn how not to invalidate. Now, you might be saying, 
But what if the garbage does need to be taken out? Well, you could either take it out yourself and say, oh, let me just grab the garbage. If it's a recurring pattern, you can learn to sit down and talk about it and say, you know, I would really appreciate it, not at that moment, another time. You know, when you clean the kitchen, can you also take the garbage out? Or you can give it to your son to take out. Or give it to someone else to take out. Have a schedule. Have some plan. Some problems are just not really problems. So don't make them problems. We have enough other real problems to deal with. And the final pattern that we're dealing with is withdrawal and avoidance. And withdrawal and avoidance occurs actually when so many of these other patterns are present that you get to the place where you just withdraw from the relationship. And so when we hear people say, you know, we grew apart, well, we grew apart because there were so many other things that were present in the relationship. And now, I don't even want to be around you. I don't want to be in your presence. I don't like being where you are. So we withdraw from the relationship and we avoid. Now, there's, now there's, this is, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> there's a caveat that I want to add to that because we have counseled couples where there are people in the relationship who from the very beginning are very, uh, they, they have like avoidant type personalities. They really are just non-confrontational and they don't want to deal with issues. That's very different than what we're talking about and yet it does impact what we're talking about because if you have someone in a relationship who avoids conversation, then it's hard to have a conversation with them. And so we have to learn how not to avoid the conversations that we need to be intimate with one another. I want to give you um, a gift. We gave it to the pastors earlier this week, and we want all of you to go home with this concept in your minds. And that is the concept of the emotional bank account. And the emotional bank account works just like a regular bank account. Well, how does it work? Well, how many of you have bank accounts? Well, you're not raising your hand. This is not a Nigerian scheme. I'm, I'm not trying to siphon your money. <laughs> okay, so lots of you have bank accounts. And the way it works is you put in money, you got money. You make a withdrawal, you got less money. So you make a deposit, you got money. Make some more deposits, got more money. Make another deposit, you got more money. I see um, Pastor Errol Thomas there, who was one of the giants here in Jamaica that were standing on his shoulders. You know, in family ministries, good to see you. We saw your wife last night. So that's how it works. So when you're kind to your spouse, you're making a deposit. You know, you say, you look really nice this morning. That's a deposit. You open the car door. That's a deposit. You cook a good meal. That's a deposit. You say, what a wonderful meal. That's a deposit. So withdrawal and avoidance begins to take place when you've made so many withdrawals that there's no longer currency in the relationship. What happens when you make more withdrawals than you made deposits? What happens? And, and, you, and you write a check. What happens? It bounces. And then the bank sends you a notice and says, insufficient funds, insufficient emotional deposits. That's when people check out of the marriage. That's when people get divorced. That when, that's when people want to separate. They don't want to be there. Why? Because instead of making emotional deposits in your spouse's emotional bank account, all you're doing is making withdrawals and more withdrawals and more withdrawals. And what we want to learn to do, people of God, is to make deposits in each other's lives. After all, that's why God gave us marriage. I mean, I could do poorly all by myself. So you get married to enhance your life so that you could be like Jesus. So you could reflect the image of God. That's why in Genesis it says, male and female created he them in the image of God created he them. He gave us marriage to reflect the image of God. And we do that when we deposit emotionally in each other's lives. That's a gift. All right, very quickly, we'd like for you to spend some time. This is a couple exercise that should be in your, your handout. And we want you to spend some time. It says individually, but think about it a little bit. You probably thought as we were speaking anyway, which of the four patterns can you identify in your relationship? Which of the four patterns can you identify in your relationship? Think about when and how this happens and what effect do you think it has on your relationship? Also, what can you do to eliminate some of these patterns from your relationship? So just talk with yourselves, identify some of those patterns. To be honest, a lot of times we have all of them. 
And we might even have all of them in one conversation. So discuss amongst yourselves and talk a little bit. We'll give you five minutes.
Okay, so hopefully that was a useful exercise for you. Again, we want to remind you that the conversation doesn't need to end after the five minutes, that we hope that you will continue these conversations when you get back home or on your way home. Okay, so solving your solvable problems. We're going to give you uh, five steps to problem solving. And uh, I want to begin with the first one, which is prayer. The, the reality is, as people of God, as Christians, if we put God first in our problem solving, we know that it can be solved. Because with God on our side, we cannot fail. We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. So the first thing we want to do is pray together and ask God to give us the right spirit, to give us the right mind, the right frame of mind, the right attitude, that as we talk about this issue that has been between us, we can have it dissipate through the spirit of God. So number one. Number two, problem discussion. One of the biggest issues in marriage as we try to solve problems, we don't solve our problems because we don't listen to each other. Um, and so problem discussion is let's talk about the issues without trying to solve them now. I need to know what you're saying, what you're feeling, and you need to know what I'm saying and what I'm feeling. But you, you'll never know that unless you listen to me, unless I listen to you. So this needs, needs to be problem discussion. And, and we're just talking about what we see from our side and, um, and usually use I messages. I, this, is, this is the issue for me. I see this happening. I see that every Sabbath we need to get to church and uh, we can't seem to get out of the house because we're always late. You know, this, this is what I see as the problem. So uh, during that time, the spouse or whoever it is is not trying to defend himself or herself. You're just listening to what the person's issue is. And then the other person gets to, to speak about it. And then number three, specify the issue. Now, I don't know whether you know this or not. Many of you have figured it out by now, and some of you know it because of your training, that, you know, men and women are different. And, and men are, we're really simple beings. You, you women are very complicated. <laughs> you know, you, you got a lot going on. And, I mean, we have two channels, on and off. You know, I mean, you're talking about finances. Let's talk about finances. You're talking about the kids. Let's talk about the kids. We can't talk about finances and the kids and vacation and your mother-in-law and your daughter-in-law and we can't handle it. It's just too much. You know, we're very simple beings. You know, tell us one thing at a time. So specify the issue. What is it we're talking about today? You know, what is it we're talking about today? That we need to get ready for church on time? That we need to make our Finances, you know, balance our checkbook, you know, that we need to spend less and uh, save more. Let's specify the issue. And then, of course, number four, agreement and compromise. We're different. We're human beings. We were raised in different families. Hopefully you're not married to your brother or your sister. In some places, it's like that, you know. Uh, we, had, we have a friend that uh, when we were in the North American division, he and his wife, they used to present with us for marriage conferences and she's from Virginia. I don't know how much you know about Virginia in the United States. It's in the South. And, and sometimes there's a lot of inbreeding in those little towns where there's so few of them, you know, people marrying their cousins and what have you. I don't know if it happens here in Jamaica, you know. <laughs> anyway, when they started their presentation, he would say, you know, when I met my wife, you know, she had just broken up with her brother. <laughs> anyway. Because we weren't raised in the same family, you know, we do things differently, even here in Jamaica. You know, even if we eat some of the same foods, my mom cooked different than your mom, and, you know, I like the food this way, and you like it a different way. So agreement and compromise. You know, let's get to know each other. Let's, let's listen to each other. Let's agree and compromise, and by that we mean nobody's perfect. And it's not all about doing it the Oliver way or the Powell way, you know, because we don't listen to our parents when we're growing up, but once we get married... We want our spouse to do exactly what we did in our home. Now, we didn't listen to our parents, but now we're married, and this is how you do it. I mean, what are you coming with, you know? I mean, the Powells don't know how to do it. We need to do it the Oliver way. The Olivers knew how to do it. It doesn't work. Agreement and compromise. And then, of course, uh, number five, be tolerant of each other's faults. You know, you married someone uh, who was uh, five feet two, 
and five years down the road you want the man to be five feet ten. <laughs> You know, it doesn't happen, you know, or, or, or you married your husband or you married your wife and all of a sudden you want him to look different, or you want her to look different. It's interesting about men and women. Men get married and expect their wives not to change. Women get married and expect their husbands to change. And they do and they don't. So it's a problem. So be tolerant of each other's faults because nobody's perfect. But these are some five steps to problem solving that if you employ them, uh, in an open manner, through the, the power of God, you can actually get something done. And Elaine is going to give you some specifics about how you can do that. All right, so when we're talking about problem discussion, what we've realized is that if we start with prayer, we take time aside, actually. It's a good thing to decide when you're going to talk about your problem so that you're not just talking about them all the time. Now, this is something that you work up to because most of us, we just have to get it off our chest. You know, the problem with that is, you know, when we just need to get it off our chest, then it really creates a barrier to oneness. So we need to learn to set aside some time when we can talk, when we're both level-headed and cool-headed, we begin with prayer. And as Willie said earlier, um, it's really hard to really pray and then not have a conversation go right. I mean, if we're really praying and we're really allowing the Lord to soften our hearts, to work through us, for us not to be able to resolve this problem and have a good discussion. So when we're discussing, we realize that many of our situations can be resolved because we are now listening to each other. So there's a certain technique to use, and many of you may already know it. It's called here the speaker-listener technique, but it really is just active listening. And what is active listening? Active listening is determining who's going to speak first. So with this technique, there are going to be rules for the speaker. Identify who will speak first. Okay, you're going to speak first. Speak for yourself. Don't mind read. Keep your statements brief. Don't go on and on and stop to let the listener paraphrase. So when I speak for myself, I'm going to say, you know, I feel frustrated when we agree that we're gonna leave for church on Sabbath mornings at 8.30, and 8.30 comes and you're still not ready. I feel frustrated. So you're talking about your feelings. Come up with some feelings. Now, some of you may have difficulty identifying your feelings. You know, look for a sheet of feelings. I feel upset. I feel Taken for granted. mad. Taken for granted. I, and it's okay to say, I feel angry. I feel mad that you're not ready. I feel taken for granted. No one can argue with you about your feelings, but keep it to your feelings. Because really, that's what's wrong with us when we're upset. We feel frustrated because our feelings are being taken for granted. So I feel upset, I feel mad um, when we leave late and I, I show up late for church every Sabbath. That just makes me very anxious and uncomfortable. Try to keep your statements brief. As, as we said earlier, don't speak about everything on the planet now that you have an opportunity. To, to speak, just speak about that particular issue. Save the other issues for another time. And stop to let the listener paraphrase. What does that mean? It means that you pause and then there are rules for the listener and the listener will paraphrase what they heard. And the listener will also focus on the speaker's message and not rebut. So let's so, try it. Okay, let's try it. Go for it. All right. Um, I feel hurt when I well, stay with the time and go have, into church. when we've agreed, you know, we talked about it the night before that we would leave for church at 8.30 and, um, you know, 8.30 comes on Sabbath mornings and we're still not leaving for church and it's nine o'clock and we're still not leaving and then we arrive at church very late. I feel very just, it makes me upset, it makes me angry. Now, while she's speaking, I'm thinking about rebuttals, but I'm not gonna do that. I'm, I'm thinking about excuses, why, why we're not ready, why I'm not ready. Well, well you know, I, I wanna tell her, well, well, after breakfast, you asked me to do this and to do that and to do the other, and that's why I'm not ready now. But I'm not gonna say any of that. 
because we're not trying to solve it. I'm just trying to convey to her that I've heard her and understood her. So here's how I'm going to respond to that. So I'm hearing you say that you feel angry and hurt and all kinds of other things about when we agreed to go to church at 8.30 and it's 9 o'clock and we're still at home. Yes. See? Are you with me? All you're trying to convey to your spouse is that you heard and understood. You're not trying to defend yourself. Yeah? You're not trying to rebut. Or agree. You're not trying to blame. You're trying to convey to your spouse that you heard and understood. Now, you may not agree with what they said. Are you with me? But if you want to stay married for a long time, we've been married for 30 years. We want another 30 years. Be smart about some things. You don't need to say everything you think, you know. You know that. It's part of stewardship. It's the stewardship of words. You don't have to say everything that's in your head. Okay? So that's the model that you want to practice to get it going. Let's go on to the other one. Rules for both. Rules for both. Um, so the speaker has the floor, meaning the speaker, when the speaker is speaking, the speaker is speaking. The speaker keeps the floor while the listener paraphrases, and then you share the floor. Now, usually we hand out a little, just a little thing that actually looks like a, a well, tile. Well, they have it in there. Like a floor tile. And um, you can make one for yourself, put it on your refrigerator to remind yourselves that you want to speak in a way that is going to resolve your situation. Okay, because it feels very awkward, and I know some of you are looking at me like, nobody has time for that. Well, you have time to um, destroy your marriage? That's the alternative. So, if we want our relationships to go well, then we need to make sure that we use strategies based on the Word of God, because the Bible has a lot to say about the tongue. Yeah. Just go back to the book of Proverbs. In fact, there's more stuff about the tongue than pretty much anything else other than money. All right? Because it's... it's um, Death and life resides with the tongue. Right? You can bless and you can curse. So we like to say to people, speak to bless. How can you bless your husband when you speak, sister? How can you bless your wife when you speak, brother? Speak to bless. God brought us here on this earth and put us together so we can bless each other. And right around now, I'm thinking about how I'm going to bless Elaine after all of this is over. <laughs> how can I bless her? Tomorrow morning, we're flying to London because we have meetings <laughs> starting on Monday morning with the Trans-European Division. So our last night in Jamaica, yes. How can I bless Elaine? Are you thinking the same things you hear? How can you bless me? Absolutely, darling. Absolutely. So when I think how to bless her, and she's thinking how to bless me, blessing square. <laughs> All right. So, so that's, that, that's the technique. And it feels uncomfortable. It really does feel uncomfortable. But the more you practice it, the better you will get at it. And the better your relationship will be because at the end of the day, we want our relationship to win. We want the us to win. But there's a gift. There's a gift. Now, men, you already know this, but I just want you to know that you're not crazy, that it's actually happening. Women speak more than men. <laughs> Invariably, they use like... Okay, okay, let me, let me put it in probabilities. Let me put it in statistical language. <laughs> Women, on average. on average, have a higher probability of speaking more than men. In fact, in scientific studies between men and women, we find out that women use at least twice as many words as men. So my brothers, your wife is going to have a lot to say. Are you with me? Okay. Once you understand that and you accept that, it doesn't matter that she does. Are you with me? we got to be smart about this. Okay, so she's going to speak twice as much as you do. But that's not the issue. That's a given. Once you have that as a given, it's going to be fine. So we're doing the speaker-listener technique, and now she's telling how she feels. I feel this, and now you've learned the... You know, the skill, well, I feel this, I feel that, I feel the other. And then you paraphrase like I just did. And then she says, yes. It means I heard and understood. But here's the gift. Here comes the gift, my brothers. Is there anything else? 
you would like to add to that? <laughs> Don't say, shut up, woman. You know, I mean, <laughs> I'm tired of hearing what you say. You know, or no. It's, or it's my turn. No, or it's my turn. You know, I mean, are you going to shut up? No, no, no. No, no, we are people of God. We don't use that kind of language. We're winsome. We're winsome. We're kind. Huh? We're the people of God. Can't be ugly. The Bible says, John 13, 35, by this they will know that you are my disciples. Because of your love one to another. We got to live scripture. Got to be kind and winsome. Is there anything else you'd like to say? That, my brothers, can win you a very good evening. I'm looking out for you, you know. I'm looking out for you. I think we're going to end here. We have a lot more to say, but we're out of time, and we're just going to go and, and, and do some of this when we come back after lunch. Let's end this way. Let's just walk them right through caring for your relationship, and then we're going to end with prayer since we're a little bit over time, and we're going to catch up this afternoon and stay right on time. Let's do it, Elaine. All right, so caring for your relationship. Expect problems anticipate differences of opinion and stay in control of yourself. And a good text to remember is found in 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Okay, so expect that there are gonna be problems. If, if you're married, you're gonna have problems. We Speaking, have good times wait, 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 too. Wait, 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 wait. Speaking about that, I just have to share this with you. My dad used to say, my father was a preacher, and, and you know, his parents were Jamaican, and, um, you know, very wise man. He's dead now. He's been dead for a few years now. My dad used to say, if you buy land, you buy stone. If you buy beef, you buy bone. You guys are familiar with that? It came from Jamaica, right? He must have gotten it from his parents. You know what I say? I'm his, I'm his son. I'm in family. I'm in marriage. You know what I say? If you're married, you got problems. <laughs> but, you know, having problems is not the biggest problem. It's how you solve your problems. Every problem can be solved through the power of God. So having problems is not the issue. It's how you solve your problems. Let's finish up here. We got to go now. All right. Take responsibility for your actions. Romans 12, 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Support your spouse's efforts to commu communicate properly. After you leave here, hopefully both of you will want to, to use the speaker-listener technique. But if only one does, support your spouse in trying to communicate properly. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, therefore comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing. Here's the truth. This stuff is hard. Isn't it? It's hard. It's hard for us. Maybe it's easy for you. It's hard for us. And we got to teach it. So you got to live what you preach. But it's hard. But I love the promise of success. What is it? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We claim that promise on your behalf, on your marriage's behalf, on your family's behalf, so that you can be all God wants you to be, so that you will be faithful witnesses and the world will know that we belong to Jesus. We're going to pray. I know there's a benediction. We like to end with prayer. So we're ending with prayer, and the, the person doing benediction, come right up, and you bless us again with prayer. Let's pray. Lord, please teach us to solve our solvable problems. And thank you that we can trust you to do just that. In Jesus' name, amen.